Well, it's, uh, it's valuable that we can spend this time together today. And it was, it was interesting to hear the prayer requests. I think there was an excellent balance of both requests and thanksgiving. Actually, it lifted my heart a bit to hear, hear some of the thanks. It's good, isn't it, just to share together where we are in each other's lives and what, we are, what our needs are and um, what we're grateful for. And we can approach God in, in so many different ways. But today we're thinking about values. And one value that we have, as a, as, actually as a world church, is representing the reign of God. I'm just going to show you this um, quotation, if I can get this thing. Oh, good, it works. So this is uh, from the General Conference. So it's like the world church. They've got the various values, and this is one of them. Our respect for diversity, individuality, and freedom is balanced by regard for community. We are one, a worldwide family of faith engaged in representing the reign of God in our world through ethical conduct, mutual regard, and loving service. Our faithfulness to God involves commitment to and support of his body, the church. So, representing the reign of God. That's really the theme that we're looking at today. And there's three areas in particular that are mentioned there, which is ethical conduct, mutual regard, and loving service. That's what we're going to be looking at. So representing the reign of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing as a church. Well, I wonder how it makes you feel, that statement. We are here to represent the reign of God. Well, if I'm honest, I feel a little embarrassed that we have that as a goal. And I think the reason is I'm frightened that people may say that we are hypocrites if we have such a high ideal. Can you imagine if we were to put in the very... Mercury. Is that our best local paper, Richard? What's the... That's the, that's the free one. The Berry Free Press is the paid one. Okay, the Berry Free Press is paid, which sounds a bit strange. <laughs> well, if we were to put it in either of those, that the, the Adventist church community claims to represent the reign of God in this area. I wonder how people would respond. I wonder if people would accept it. Would some come to this church as a result? Well, would they laugh at it? Would they just hurl scorn at it and say, who do they think they are? In some ways, it seems so pretentious and arrogant. In my mind, at least, I think somebody, if someone made a claim like that, I would think, really? Are they actually representing the reign of God? There's been so much publicity in recent years about... Uh, governmental, business, and organizational corruption. Um, just last week, I don't know if anybody's here from Brazil. Actually, I think one or two of you may be. Carlos Nuzman, did you hear about that? He was in charge of the Rio Olympics, and he was being arrested due to claims that he was actually corrupt and uh, was taking bribes so the Olympics could go there. And in recent years, there's been various cases. There was a while ago, there was the way the the rich hide their money in tax havens in places such as Panama, which may not be illegal, but is far from best practice. Um, and big companies avoid tax. That was a year or two ago. Uh, Google, Amazon, they don't want to pay tax, so they register in some other country. A few years ago, there was a, there was a bit of a scandal in this country with the MPs' expenses. Do you remember that? How the MPs were taking public money and doing various things with it. The most famous one was the one MP who built a, a duck house, a nice um, little place where the ducks could stay on, it, on his lake, and it cost quite a lot of money. Well, these are relatively minor things. I know some countries have a lot more problems with corruption than we do here, but it certainly happens. Well, that's about the rich and the famous. What about churches and so-called religious people. 
Are they, are we, any better? Well, in some ways, yes, religions do operate by different standards. In other ways, though, we've done really badly. There's been much evidence of sexual abuse by leaders, and then it's cover-up. So that sort of thing is very much in, in people's minds when it comes to organized religion. So if a group claimed to be representing the reign of God, in the minds of many, that concept of abuse and the denial and hiding of it would cause them to say, well, if that's the reign of God, I want nothing to do with it. Not that every local church has been involved in these things, of course. But the point is, the potential of it is always there, even if they haven't actually happened. If you've been around enough churches, you will be aware that bad things happen. And those things, they tend to stick in your mind more than the good. In churches I've been involved in, more than one have had treasurers that have taken church money. Their Nazi regime, very much so, very outspoken, and he was eventually, uh, he, he, he was hanged because he was so much, you know, he's really against that evil um, um, sort of political dogma that was going on and all the horrors of it. Now, this is what he says. Who stands fast? Only the man whose final standard is not his reason, his principles, his conscience, his freedom or his virtue, but who is ready to sacrifice all this when he's called to obedient and responsible action in faith and in exclusive allegiance to God, the responsible man who tries to make his whole life an answer to the question and call of God, where are these responsible people? Well, so there's a theory. We should be living by principle, by God's ways. We need to be living according to those very high ethical principles. Well, how does that apply to you and me? I've spoken of those that mess up badly. Well, we might be in that category, but most of us are not. For the most part, as I say, we're reasonably nice, you know, law-abiding people. But how do you and I live consistently to those high ethical standards? Well, for a start, it would help if we could be honest when we fail. Consider this scripture. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, our emphasis on this passage is usually that we can be forgiven, which is there. But bearing in mind what we're saying today, the emphasis should be on the confession and acknowledgement of our wrong. Take the cases of uh, things that have gone wrong in the church, for instance. The damage is magnified many times because of the cover-up and the denial that nearly always happens. If you have a situation where a church leader sexually abused a child, let's say the child tells their parents who go to the authorities. The leader is named. Wouldn't it be different if that leader were to acknowledge their sin and the pain it has caused quickly? What's more, imagine if the employing body were to also just to own up and to do damage limitation. This person would never be allowed to be with vulnerable people again. And if that approach were taken, much less damage would be done to the church. Of course, it seldom happens. Human nature means that when we do wrong, our natural instinct is just to deny, to cover up. The very first sin committed by Adam and Eve was the eating of the forbidden fruit. And when God asked me if they'd eaten it, they couldn't bring themselves to say, yes, they blamed each other. They blamed the serpent. Already their reaction was to deny rather than to confess. So that instinct to deny is not just the individuals. It's also that of the larger body. The desire is to protect the institution rather than the individual. 
So the first step for each of us is to recognise this tendency to hide our wrong is natural, is there with all of us, but we need to pledge to fight it as the damage it causes is immense. And if we did that, if we were to quickly own up when, when we were found out doing something wrong, that would be fostering a community of mutual support and honesty, and we'd be able to hold each other to account. The way forward is not to assume our inherent holiness, but rather to acknowledge our inherent sinfulness, but also to want to live contrary to it. So that's the first point, really, on, on ethical conduct. Now thinking about mutual regard. Unconditional positive regard is a concept developed by humanistic psychologist Carl Rogers. I don't know if we have any counsellors among us, but I actually think his, his theory is really good. It's the basic acceptance and support of a person, regardless of what that person says or does, especially in the context of client-centred therapy. And I think there's a lot of sense in this approach. If someone is valued highly, they tend to improve. And again, that's our approach as Christians, it should be. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. That's huge, isn't it? We, we sort of state that off very glibly and quickly, but if you really think about it, if you value somebody more than yourself, that's an absolutely incredible attitude to hold. That is to be our approach. The first church, first Adventist church I ever attended, it was actually in, in Cambridge. And there was a deacon that loved to greet and welcome people. In fact, he felt it was so important that he stayed outside the whole time. Not quite outside, there was a foyer, and there was a glass uh, between the church and the foyer, but he stayed there all the time, all the way through Sabbath school, all the way through the worship service. So you could say, well, he got nothing out of his time at church. But for him, he came to serve. He valued people so highly, he wanted to make sure that everybody got a really warm welcome and a nice smile. And it was absolutely fantastic. He was the first person I met when I came to an Adventist church. And he, it was just wonderful to walk in and you just know every week he was there to give you that welcome. He valued everybody that came through that door. He certainly put other people's needs above his own. Now Jesus taught and lived this value of mutual regard. And we're to view people that way, both inside and outside the church, with regard, with respect. And the world expects no less. Now, we tend to joke about um, laws from the EU. <laughs> Actually, Richard mentioned one that this morning. He said we get some daft laws from the EU. And it's true, we do. But I'm just going to list a few, not to say how daft they are, but... I just want you to think about the value that's behind these laws. Now, don't misunderstand me here, because some of these, um, we would disagree with them, because there are aspects of them that go against biblical teaching. Just put that to the side for a minute. I just want you to think what's behind them. And I think what's really behind them is a value of people. See what you think. Uh, is this working, Ricardo? Yeah, here we go. No. Uh, okay, let's start with that one. Proposal for a directive of 2nd July 2008 against discrimination based on age, disability, sexual orientation, and religion or belief beyond the workplace. Okay, now we might disagree. That sexual one, that brings up questions. But I think we would agree we shouldn't discriminate against somebody, whatever they're like, because they just thought everybody is of equal value. 2004 on the right of citizens of the Union and family members to move and reside freely within the territory of the member states. And that's one reason that we went out of Europe. But again, it's the idea that everybody, you know, got the freedom, the right to travel wherever they want. 
general framework for equal treatment in employment and occupation. Well, we all want equal treatment and employment. We're all uh, of equal value. 2000, implementing the principle of equal treatment between persons irrespective of racial or ethnic origin. I don't think there's any doubt about that one. So all these, okay, we, could have, we may have some questions about some of these from a biblical point of view, whatever. But for me, when I, when I read them, I think what's deeply behind them is this concept that everybody is important. Nobody should be discriminated against. So the world is kind of trying to put people on an equal playing field. Mutual regard is something the world takes theory, seriously, at least in theory. Now, for us as Christians, we also have it in theory as well. But in practice, do we actually have this mutual regard for all people? Now, great unmentionable is racial discrimination. It's easier to admit to being a shoplifter than to admit any kind of racial prejudice at all. Now, just, just put in your mind, just try to, try to picture in your mind a racist. What do you think somebody who is racially prejudiced looks like? We tend to have an image, don't we? I won't say what it is. You can just imagine, oh, that person is more likely to be racially prejudiced than that person. Now, have a look at this young lady. Do you think she... Would that sort of image come out in your mind as somebody who is racially prejudiced? Well, I wouldn't have thought so, just looking at her. But a year ago, this lady, she was Luton's youngest... She was 20 years old. She was suspended from the Labour Party for anti-Jewish remarks. She said that Hitler was the greatest man in history. Now, she doesn't seem to be the sort of person to say things like that. Racism comes from surprising places. And it could be in each of us. We don't look like we're racist. We would never acknowledge it. Just because we don't admit it or we don't look like it doesn't mean there may be something of that inside each of us. And as Christians, we need to keep looking deep within to see if any attitude is present that prevents this mutual regard for all people. Now, loving service. Now, in some ways, okay, this is easier. Uh, we can do acts of loving service. We may not do them consistently, but we can do them. That way, we do represent the reign of God, as God's very character is love. By the way, we did... Um, can you just pass me a box, Richard, please? We, um, I was quite amazed. We came, I came here last Sunday for the meeting, and we had... I don't know. We, we, we had so many of these... You know these boxes that are um, presents for children in Rwanda? And you, you collected so many that I could hardly get them... Admittedly, it wasn't a very big car, but the, the car was actually filled to bursting. Um, you, as a small church, did a, a really good act of loving service by giving all those boxes. And this afternoon, we're going to talk about turning some of our Sabbath lunches into a kind of loving service. We want to see if we can open it to the community. Um, so we, we are doing some acts of loving service. Loving service... It's very practical. Consider this next quote from the prophet Amos. It's in Amos 5, if you want to have a look at it. Amos wrote about 760 BC. And God spoke through him, warning of punishment to come if Israel just carried on living the way they did. They had become an increasingly sinful nation. And it wasn't just that they were worshipping other gods. It was also about the practical way they lived, and the way they treated people. This is a sample of what Amos had to say. You levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. 
Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offences and how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. So loving service in the time of Amos had to do with treating the poor fairly and with justice. It's about living a life of integrity. And you find this theme a lot in the minor prophets. You get the impression that God hates it when he sees injustice. And these prophets were his spokespeople. They reflected God's compassionate nature and the way he was against those who took advantage of the poor. So we have to think about what loving service means to us in our context. What does it mean to you? What does it mean for our church? Are there injustices around us that we can do anything about? Is there suffering in our community that we can have a part in easing? There's an organization called BACA, Bikers Against Child Abuse. And it actually is a worldwide thing. There are groups of bikers that protect children that have been abused. In one situation, a 12-year-old girl had been abused by her stepfather for two years. She told her mother, who threw him out. That doesn't always happen, but in this case, she did. The girl was terrified that he would come back. Her whole personality changed. She became insular, quiet, scared. Backer got involved. They turned up at her house on about 20 motorbikes. And from that time on, her life turned around. They took her to school. They took her in turns to sleep outside her house until the case came to trial. They did all they could to keep this girl safe from her abuser. They even went to court with her. And as a result, the abuser was jailed. And she got the confidence to start living her life again. Acts of loving service come from places that we wouldn't expect. Do you remember the greatest commandment? It's in Matthew 22. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the second commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Loving service. It shouldn't be too difficult for us to identify local needs and play a part in meeting them as acts of love to our neighbors. So this is what we're living for, to represent the reign of God in the world. That's a huge task and it stretches us to the absolute limit. I said at the beginning that I'm embarrassed really to have it as a goal, as we could be criticized for not living up to it. That may be the case, but it shouldn't prevent us from having this high ideal to live up to. Maybe we shouldn't shout about it, and we certainly won't be putting it in the paper. I don't think we'll put it on our website either. But the thing to do it's just live it. Actions speak a lot louder than words. We are to live it. When we make mistakes, by the way, I didn't say if, when we make mistakes as Christians, we need to be quick to acknowledge them and to put right what we can. And that goes for us in our relationships too. It isn't just what you do, is how quickly you can admit and seek to atone. Actually, for me, one difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, it isn't just that the Christian never does anything wrong. It's that the Christian, ideally, when the Christian does something wrong, the Christian is able to acknowledge, 
turn away from the wrong, seek to do right. Hopefully we won't do so many things wrong, but we will do things that are wrong. But it's how we respond afterwards that's absolutely critical. Now, as a result of that, we may not stand out. What stands out is not goodness, but evil. People notice wrong more than right. But there is a scripture worth remembering here, and I'm going to close with this. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, that is biblical. And now it may be it takes a lot of light. I think it does. I think it takes a lot of light before it's noticed because people notice the bad or the dark, not the light. So maybe it's behoven on us to uh, generate a lot, a lot of light and then it's more likely to be noticed. Our task is to represent the reign of God in the world through ethical conduct mutual regard and loving service. Now, we're never going to do it perfectly, but we do need to keep trying and to maintain that as a high goal to aim for. Amen.